Now that we have the logic for the game state working, it's time for us to add a user interface so that the player can interact with the game. So we'll go in here and we will create a scene and let's make it a user interface scene and we'll just call it main. There are a couple things we're going to need. So first of all, I'm going to add an H box. I'm going to have it take up the entire screen. And then I'm going to add three center containers. The middle center container is going to be the board. And the ones on the left and the right are going to be for the X and O players. One thing we want on the board is the actual grid that we're playing on. So let's add a texture rectangle and we will add grid. All right, we want to make the grid a bit larger than this. So let's say 100 by 100 is the minimum size. That's actually not that much bigger. 300 by 300. Then um, each of the tiles can be 100 by 100. In our code, we refer to positions on the grid using a vector with an X and a Y coordinate. So for the sake of convenience, I'm going to create a scene to go in each of these spaces that will hold the position information about that space. New scene, let's call it box. And box is going to be pretty simple. It's just going to, first of all, it's going to be a texture rectangle. Uh, no texture yet, but the minimum size, uh, we said the grid is 300 by 300. So we will have the minimum size of this be 100 by 100. Now, as for textures, I created this sprite sheet and we're going to want to create separate Atlas textures for the X and the O. Let me create a resource and X sprite will simply be this region. Um, we'll start at 32 since that's the size and, oh, okay, that's actually O, not X, um, that's fine. I will just duplicate this, call it O sprite, and then uh, X sprite, we just go another 32, so 64, so that grabs this. When I put the texture in here, it gets stretched out like this. I don't really like that, so let's say fit, Stretch mode, keep aspect, expand mode, I guess just keep size. We'll just try this for now. So going back to main, on this grid, we can add a grid container for layout purposes and make it cover the entire grid texture. Add three columns and then you can test this out by instancing the box texture nine times. Okay, and it looks like the size of this texture is not quite quite what we want. I'm just going to go to it and change it. So keep aspect, keep size. Let's try that. That's what we want. And in fact, we would like to make it easy to switch between the box being empty or having an X or an O in it. And the box is not going to start off with an O, so let's just reset the texture. We can modify that uh, in the code as needed. But yeah, for now, box is just going to be empty and we have nine of them. We want each box to know its own location. So I'm going to attach a script. I'm going to call it box.gd export var position. Although actually position is already a thing for this node. So export var location, which is a vector two. And then up here, we can go into each box, go to its location and set it to the value as reflected in the code that we wrote earlier. So in this one is zero, one. All right, now we need a way for the player to modify these. For the sake of simplicity, we're just going to use Godot's built-in drag and drop methods. If you haven't used this before, Godot provides methods for dragging and dropping data in the control class. So we've got can drop data, which evaluates whether data can be dropped into a given control node. Uh, we have drop data, which is what happens when you actually drop the data. We have get drag data. Um, and another thing that we'll need to use is set drag preview. So I will show you how to use these. First, we need a source for the data. I'm going to create a texture rectangle here, and this will be the X source. We'll put X sprite as the texture, and we'll give it a minimum size of 100. Similarly, uh, in the other box, we'll put an O source, and we will use the O sprite for that one. I'm just going to rename these containers left and right. I'm going to attach a script, and I'll just call it source. We'll make it generic so that we can have it for both the X and the O. So we'll call it source.gd. First of all, we're going to want to export the drag and drop data. So export var drag data which I think will just represent as a string, uh, either an X or an O. And then um, we need to implement the drag methods. First of all, get 
drag data, the position doesn't actually matter. The, the position would be if dragging on a different part of the control gives you different data, but we're not doing that. So this is this variable is not going to be important. Let's take a look at how this works. So Godot calls the method to get data that can be dragged and dropped onto controls that expect drop data. It also says a preview that will follow the mouse that should represent the data can be set with set drag preview, and a good time to set the preview is in this method. So there's uh, two things that we want here. We want to return the data that's going to be dropped. So in this case, uh, we'll return drag data. However, we also want to set the preview, set drag preview. If we take a look at this method, it shows the given control at the mouse pointer, and the control must not be in the scene tree, and you should not free the control. So basically, we need a new control node that's going to be shown wherever the mouse is, and we don't want to use an existing one. But uh, an easy way to get this, if we look at the scene, the X source and the O source are already controls that have the texture that we want to display when dragging and dropping. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the drag preview to duplicate. Now the duplicate method duplicates the node returning a new node. Um, and it says you can fine tune the behavior with flags. We have um, flags for duplicating signals, groups, and scripts. And then we also have this duplicate using instancing. We don't care about any of this. So when we call duplicate, we are going to do so with a flag of zero. All we're duplicating is, is literally the nodes and not the scripts or anything else that are associated with it because the node itself has this texture here, which is really the only thing we care about for the drag preview. And if you wanna see how this looks, um, let's just boot up this scene so you can see I can drag this X. Right now I can't drop it anywhere, but I can drag it over to the grid. So for X source, the drag data is going to be an X. And for O source, we need to add the source script to it. And then we'll set the drag data to be an O. The next thing we have to handle is actually dropping the data. So we're dropping the data into these boxes, which means we need to implement can drop data um, we don't care about the position. Right now, the data is just a string. We might potentially have other drag and drop data types. I'll just say we can drop the data if the data is a string. In order to determine whether or not we should modify box, I think we're actually going to pass that decision up. Let's attach a script to board. We'll have board.gd. And board is going to make all the decisions on when to actually change the graphics of the, the individual boxes, because board knows the state of the entire board, presumably. So when we actually drop the data, implementing drop data, again, we don't care about the position. Drop data is being called on an individual box. We are just going to emit a signal, and then we will have board handle that signal. Let's do signal data dropped, and we'll just say what the data is. So when we drop the data, we will emit signal data dropped with the data. Oh, and this needs to be a string. Now jumping over into the script for board, we could connect the data dropped signals for each box individually. I think it's going to be probably more convenient if we just programmatically connect them. So in the ready function, we're going to say for box in grid container dot get children. We are going to connect the data dropped signal. In Godot 4, the syntax for connect is a bit different. So we're going to refer to the signal data dropped box dot data dropped dot connect. And then we name a method for it. So on box data dropped. Um, and actually, this is not a string anymore. It is a callable. The ingodo for we have first class functions. So on box data dropped, we will have the box, which is a control node, and we will have the data, um, which is a string. Actually, let's, I think we need to put the data first. Let's just take a quick look at the documentation for connection. So we give it a callable and you can provide additional arguments by callable.bind, which is what we'll want to do. It returns a copy of the callable with one or more arguments bound. When called, the bound arguments are passed after the argument supplied by call. So the argument supplied by call is the data. We emit data dropped with data as the argument. So if we want additional arguments, yeah, they need to come after that. Onbox data dropped has arguments data, which we get from the signal and then box, which we're binding additionally. 
So we will say bind box. Okay, we also want board to have a copy of the game state. Our game state equals game state dot new. And now we have the pieces that we need uh, to assemble this puzzle. In game state, remember we have this method is move legal, where you can check whether you're allowed to place something at a given position. If we remember our box, box has a location, which is its position in the grid. When we drop data on a box, we can first check whether it's a legal move. So var, let's say var is legal move equals game state dot is move legal and then the move being box dot location. If it's not a legal move, we don't need to do anything when we drop data into a box. If not is legal move, we just return. If it is a legal move, we want to actually make the move. Going back to our game state, we remember we have place letter, which takes the letter, which is the data that we're getting from the data dropped signal. And we have the position, which is the position of the box. Given that it's a legal move, we will say game state dot place letter. Uh, the letter is the data. And then the location is box dot location. And finally, we want to update the box texture to match whatever the letter is. Let's match uh, data. Um, if it's an X, then we are going to say box dot texture because remember box is a texture rectangle preload we want the x sprite x sprite if the data is an o box dot texture equals preload o sprite it looks like i misspelled children so let's just fix that okay box dot text there is no box dot text it should be box dot texture so we have x which we put there we have o which we put there right now it's not restricting whose turn it is that's okay this is just a simple example. And if we try to put, say, an O over an X, you can see nothing happens. The final thing we need to do is we need to indicate when a player has won the game. We're not going to do anything fancy here. I'm just going to add a label. Game ongoing is what it will say for now. I'll, I'll have it be a child of the grid so that we can move it around. I'm just going to move it down here. Every time we make a move, so whenever we drop this, we're going to check whether the game is over. If we go back to our game state, we remember we have get winner. Let's say var winner equals game state dot get winner. And the winner is either an empty string or it is an X or an O. So let's match the winner. We can ignore the empty string. We just won't do anything. But match winner. If it's an X, then status.text will equal player x1. And likewise, if the winner is O, then we will say player O1. All right, and now we have our game. We go x, we have an O, x, player O makes a very bad mistake here. And then there we go, player x1. And that's our tic-tac-toe game. Obviously, there are a lot of improvements that we could make to this, but we're not going to because the point of this was to show you how to use unit tests in a game. And I think really the key to using unit tests when you're designing a game is to try to separate out as much of the logic as possible from the user interface so that when we actually program the player facing aspects of the game, they're as simple as possible and we're just leaning on the verified code that we have the unit tests for. Thanks for watching.